Okay, well, I hope you've been enjoying the rest of the material in week four, and I'm going to use uh, my couple of videos for this week to talk about one of my sor favorite sources of interesting problems, uh, which is centripetal acceleration and orbits or gravity. So, what I want to talk about is how you can have um, centripetal acceleration, which is an acceleration that causes an object to move in a circle. So I've got a circle, and I've got an object that is moving on that circle. If you imagine that in order to stay on that circle, the velocity of that object has to be perfectly tangential. That means it's straight away. If the circle were to suddenly break, it would keep going in a straight line off in that direction. So in order for it to stay on that circle, there must be something that is pulling it inward to try and bring it away from that direction and closer into the circle. And if you imagine uh, that that object at different points on the circle, its instantaneous velocity is always tangent to the circle. So like that, and there's always something that is pulling it back in, down, towards the circle. That's what a centripetal force is or a centripetal acceleration. So let me put the center of the circle right about there. That means that at this point there's a force and an acceleration that points inwards that is pulling the object in and that's what keeps it on the circle. And it always points in towards the center. So one of the things you saw in the other materials is that the acceleration that keeps you on a circle called the centripetal acceleration is your velocity squared divided by the radius. So a bigger radius of a circle requires a smaller acceleration to keep you on the circle. And the bigger velocity as you go around the circle requires a bigger acceleration to keep you on the circle. And if you put that together with Newton's second law, which says that if you add up all the forces on an object, you get the mass times the acceleration of that object. And you say, well, okay, the only acceleration acting on this object is that centripetal acceleration, the thing that's keeping it on the circle. That means a force that keeps an object on a circle is equal to the mass of the object times the velocity that you're going around the circle squared divided by the radius. So that means the bigger your mass, the more force you need to keep you on the circle. The bigger your velocity, the more force you need to keep, on, keep you on that circle. And the bigger the radius of the circle, the smaller the force you need to keep you on the circle. So it's easier to keep you on a bigger circle than a smaller circle. Okay, so let's put that together with what we know from Newton's universal law of gravitation. Newton's gravitational equation, which is one of the big things that he was uh, justifiably famous for, is one of his major contributions to physics, was figuring out this relationship, was that the force between two massive objects due to gravity is equal to a uh, universal constant g times the mass of one object times the mass of the other object divided by the radius squared. And one, one of the universal things in the universal law of gravitation is that that g is the same everywhere in the universe. It's the same number for every planet. And that's pretty interesting because that might not be what you would expect. And then it depends on the product of the two masses. So bigger masses have a bigger force. The farther apart they are, the smaller the force is. All right, well, let's, let's kind of put those two things together. Let's imagine you have a gravitational force that is keeping you moving on a circle. That's exactly what happens in an orbit. So if you have a satellite orbiting around the Earth, the force that is keeping it on that circular orbit is gravity. And that force has to follow this centripetal force relationship in order for it to actually stay on a circle. So we've got a force that is determined by this and a result of it that is determined by this. So we're going to put those two things together. So let's rewrite the gravitational law. So the force due to gravity is negative big G times the mass of the planet or whatever big thing is pulling it. So I'm going to make that big M times the mass of your satellite or other object that is rotating times the radius squared of that object, how, as in how far away the object is from the center of the Earth. 
all right? And then I know the result of that force is going to be to keep the object in a circular orbit. That means the force has to be equal to the F sub C. So it has to be equal to the mass times the velocity squared over the radius. All right, here we have one of the most interesting things, which is that the mass of the object that is being kept in that orbit is on both sides of the equation. That means it cancels out and it doesn't matter. So the properties of an orbit are, do not depend on the mass of the object that's orbiting. That was a very surprising thing that Newton and others discovered. And it was one of the things actually that Galileo was known for, was figuring that out. Okay, well we can also cancel out one of these radii. So this radius here is gonna cancel one of the ones on the other side. So that goes there, all right. And that's gonna give us that the velocity squared, oh, and I forgot something. I really should put a negative sign in up here for the centripetal force because that force is what's keeping it in. It's pulling it back in. So there should be a negative sign on both sides. Uh, and that negative sign is going to cancel out. So there's a negative sign there, a negative sign there. Those both go away. And now I've got V squared equals this stuff. The negative signs go away. I've got the velocity squared that keeps you in a circular orbit due to gravity is big G times the mass of the planet or whatever the big thing is pulling you divided by the radius of the orbit. And then I can solve for the velocity to figure out what velocity will keep you in a circular orbit when it's gravity that's providing the force that keeps you in that orbit. That's velocity is the square root of g m over r. Okay, that's a very general equation. That holds true for any orbit around any, any sorry, any circular orbit around any large gravitational object like a planet or a sun or something like that. So let's put some numbers in there and see what that tells us. So this is the velocity of a satellite orbiting a big planet. Um, so for the, um, the data, I'm gonna go look at the International Space Station which is um, a station that's been in orbit for uh, 20 years now. Uh, a number of different countries around the world are involved in maintaining and building it and sending astronauts to uh, crew it. A bunch of science is done on it. Um, you can see flags here of a bunch of different countries that have been involved in maintaining it. Um, it's, I think it's pretty cool. Um, and I can get some data for it from right here. So right here I see that the perigee of the ISS orbit is uh, 403 kilometers. That is its closest approach. So I'm just going to use that number because it's convenient. The apogee of 408 kilometers is the farthest away it ever gets. So 403 kilometers is the radius. Um, so let me go back here. So the radius of that orbit is 403 kilometers. Well, actually, that's not quite the radius of the orbit. That's the altitude above the surface of the Earth. But the Earth has a radius, too. And the radius here isn't the distance between the two objects exactly. It's the distance between the centers of the two objects. So I need to add the radius of the Earth, which is plus uh, another 6,370 kilometers, 6,370 kilometers. So that means the radius of this orbit is 6,773 kilometers, 6,773 kilometers. Okay, and then the G is uh, a number that you can look up in tables or in the backs of books and things like that. It's Newton's universal gravitation constant, and the M is the mass of the Earth. So I'll write all of those out in one calculation, and we'll figure out what it is. So the velocity of the ISS in its orbit is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, that's Newton's gravitation constant, times the mass of the Earth, that's 5.98 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. It's big. 
divided by 6773 kilometers, which I want that to be meters really. So that should be times 10 to the third. And then I square root the whole thing. All right, so then I go back to my calculator and uh, wrong page, there we go. So then I do 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times 5.98 times 10 to the 24. Uh, divide that by the radius of the orbit, 67.73 times 10 to the third. And then I need to square root that whole thing. Answer, I get 5 point, uh, sorry, 7, 7674. 7674 watts. So 7674, 6, 7, or meters per second, which is about 7.7. Um, kilometers per second, which is roughly around four and a half or five miles per second. Pretty good. So that is the orbital speed of the ISS determined by saying that the, that the acceleration that keeps the, the station in a circular orbit is a centripetal acceleration. That causes a, a centripetal force by multiplying the mass of the station times that, that acceleration. That force is coming from gravity Newton's universal gravitation law. We combine those two things together and you rearrange to find an expression for the velocity for any orbit around a massive object. And then plug those numbers in and you get a speed. That's the speed that you need to go at in order to maintain a circular orbit at the height that the International Space Station maintains its orbit at. Okay, and, and just to take that one step further, I want to think about, well, how long does it take to complete that orbit? So since it's a circular orbit, that means the distance around, the distance of that orbit is the circumference of a circle, 2 times pi times the radius, just like the circles we were doing in, la in the lab in the first week. Okay, and velocity is distance divided by time. All right, so if I want to figure out how much time it takes to complete that orbit, I want to move the t over to the left side and the v back over. So that means the time for one orbit is the distance over the velocity, which is 2 pi times the radius of the orbit, divided by the velocity that I just figured out, 7.7 .7 kilometers per second. So 76 74 meters per second. And then we put that radius back in here. You get 2 times pi times 6773 times 10 to the third meters over 7674 meters per second, and that is, uh, oh, sorry, I can see you couldn't see all of that, uh, 76, 74 meters per second, right there, and then we go back to the calculator and calculate that, we get 2 times pi times 6773 times 10 to the third divided by 7674 and we get 5500 seconds. So I'm going to put that up a little higher so you can see it up here. So that's 5500 seconds, 5545 seconds. 45 seconds, which if you turn that into minutes by dividing by 60, you get 92.5 minutes. 92.5 minutes. 
Interesting. So let's go back over to um, the data for the space station, and we can see right there orbital period of 92.6 minutes. So we got it right. The reason it's slightly different is both because of rounding and because of the, the fact that it's not a perfectly circular orbit. There's a range of about five kilometers of the closest approach and the farthest approach. And those two together give you a very, very slightly different orbital speed, orbital um, period time it takes. So that's really cool. We were able to, with just a very little bit of data, figure out how long it has to take in order for a satellite orbiting at that particular distance to stay in a circular orbit and get all the way around the Earth. So it takes 92 and a half minutes for the space station to go all the way around once. Uh, pretty cool.